for folks who don't know, this is Ryan Macklin. He is an engineer turned game designer turned tech writer, and he focuses on empath uh, ooh, empathic, empathetic, oh, empathetic communication. Also empathic communication. He uh, he does some cool things with board games, and he does work at Google. And for those of you who did not see the picture earlier, he is a very giant kitty who is nicknamed the Blessed Orb. Uh, so I'm gonna let them take it away and do their presentation and uh, we can have questions afterwards and continue in interactions. So, I mean, we're all here as doc writers and presumably uh, you want your impact, uh, you want your writing to impact people, right? You wanna help someone with a vexing problem or empower them with key knowledge or win them over somehow, get them back to what they wanna do and you certainly don't wanna make their day worse. Uh, and to do that well, you've got to understand people. But, and this should be easy since we're all people. I mean, and maybe I won't speak for y'all, but like I'm a people, um, um, but this isn't. I mean, we already know this isn't, but like, you know, let's, it is one of the big struggles of tech writing. Um, folks come to your material while they're panicking, while they're wishing they were anywhere else, while they're angry, is wanting to turn anything to a fight and all sorts of other emotions that makes our job not straightforward. Um, so how do we handle writing for people? Um, so as Rose said, uh, I'm Ryan Macklin. Um, I'm uh, a text and UX a writer at uh, Google. Uh, I'm in the Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan uh, area. Um, I have an aforementioned cat uh, with the Instagram will be at the end of the slides, I promise. Um, I have uh, many tattoos uh, and uh, also anxiety, depression, and PTSD. I got a little trifecta there. But that trifecta drove me to take uh, empathetic written communication as a personal career focus. Uh, and today, my talk is about distilling a framework I've worked on for years into roughly 25 minutes. So, kind of get on with it. My thesis boils down to that. Um, uh, empathetic communication means meeting your readers where they are uh, and they come to your work in all sorts of different emotional states and there are dozens and dozens of these nuanced states so I've simplified them down to these five uh, what I'm right now calling personas but I'm actually workshopping a different name uh, uh, right now um, it's sort of like what you might see in like a brand new UX study, but it's not about what they're usually doing, but what about their, what they're experiencing internally. Um, uh, as you can probably see now, I had a lot of fun making them. Um, this is Avery, our anxious armadillo, Blake, our bored bear, Cam, our curious cat, Finley, our frustrated ferret, and Pat, our proud peacock. Uh, but it's kind of silly to introduce them because you've actually already met them. Uh, you've already written for them. You've already been them. You just maybe haven't thought deeply about them because they're so baked into the experience. So let's really get to know our friends here and see how we can help them out. So we'll start with Avery because I leave them sitting in the waiting room. Like they're just going to get more and more anxious. And Avery's already pretty anxious, so which we'll dive into why. Um, but first, what does Avery's mental state mean for us writers? Well it's that Avery doesn't feel safe. Uh, someone coming to our work in this sort of distress state uh, is gonna be hypervigilant. They don't feel safe right now. They're reading our instructions or email or our UI or whatever. Uh, and their brain's being chewed on by their anxiety. Their attention is pulled to perceived dangers, which means that uh, they're either not paying full attention to us or they're paying the wrong kind of attention to us, where they'll fixate on something on the screen we don't expect them to. Uh, and that gets their anxiety spiraling out. Um, and to before I go further into, into Avery, I really want to call this out. Be really firm about this throughout the entire talk and in life in general. Um, there's absolutely nothing wrong with Avery. There's nothing wrong with Avery having anxiety. That emotional space is valid and it comes from somewhere legit. Maybe it comes from our app or service or documentation or something like that. Or maybe it comes from something that has nothing to do with us. But either way, it's, you know, it's legit and there's nothing wrong with Avery. There's nothing wrong with this state. We're not trying to fix a person here. So 
Avery being everywhere, you know, imagine someone who's on edge because they're expecting an important call or someone who is going about their day all chill before hearing a sudden car honk close by. I mean, you've probably all been in the situation where suddenly your heart rate is elevated, right? Uh, in that situation, uh, you've got a little Avery servicing. Um, same as if someone is apprehensive about making an embarrassing or detrimental mistake in our after service or like sending a mass email with broken links or deleting critical data. And I am calling myself out there in both of those cases. Um, and this is something you'll see in all these personas, this, this concept that it doesn't really make a significant difference whether the emotional state is because of our after service um, or if it's because of something totally unrelated to us. Because there's still users in natural states of mind and they're still trying to get something out of the material. There's some slight elements to it that are there, but really I approach this problem from a um, emotion first, reason second uh, philosophy. Um, so how do we care for our Avery's? So one thing, like definitely make no mistake, um, what we do as like documentation writers, as, as um, you know, as sort of any role like this is a form of care work, helping people in distress is a form of care work. Um, and in this case, uh, two of the techniques that keep in mind for Avery are um, keeping to a sense of tone intentionality and making sure there are clear paths out. And tone and intentionality is about watching the language you use uh, to avoid reinforcing emotions that spiral, like anxiety definitely spirals. Uh, for instance, I avoid the word hopefully in instruction text. Um, uh, so that I give a sense of maybe this will, maybe this one, I wanna like encourage that in the mind of an Avery. Uh, and I make sure that any like uses of caution or warnings are actually worth the elevated heart rate that they could trigger in an Avery. And the other technique involves making sure there's a clear escalation path, a path to some critical support material, someone to contact, uh, et cetera, in case the anxiety builds to a point where it feels impossible to process the information, uh, where they can, like, they can't really process the information by themselves, and they need, or feel they need, uh, which is effectively the same thing, that they need to get somebody else involved. Um, or they get information that's framed in a different way that might help them break through sort of the anxiety barrier that's in their head. Um, and I mean, these are just like two techniques. I'm gonna share a couple of techniques in each of these slides. Uh, I'm sure you have plenty of other techniques in mind and I'm actually trying to catalog a lot of these uh, for a, a much bigger project. Um, and like, and you can probably maybe guess that Avery could be an entire 25 minute talk alone. Um, because the effect of anxiety on cognitive processing is not, you know, a, not a thing like, oh yeah, it happens and you sort of, you know, move on. Although that is literally what I have to do in this talk to get through it. Um, but yeah, like I said, so, um, uh, so I'll stop here um, and you'll um, kind of see as, as I go through this that the other techniques I mentioned will refer back to Avery and some of these other techniques can be used in some of our other, uh, our, our other personas. So, uh, let's go ahead and move on to Blake then. Uh, so, uh, this is me cosplaying as Blake by being very tired and low. And this is the sort of person that we're going to be engaging in now, which is our board bearer, Blake. And we're going to go on by being a little bit meta first because there could be some Blakes right now listening to this talk. Um, I sort of, as I sort of like, you know, uh, overly hinted at just a moment ago, some Blakes are tired either physically or mentally. So they're not an engageable frame of mind. You can kind of cue your, before I've had my coffee drink, right? Um, and some are dealing with depression or dissociation or situational sadness, which are very hard psychological states that are still consuming. Um, and, you know, and some may just be disinterested in this topic. Um, I'm, you know, I don't know why they're here. Maybe because a coworker or a manager told them they should watch this and, you know, but they're not necessarily engaged yet. Um, these are all ways in which a Blake, a person can, you know, manifest their Blakeness. Um, now, some of the Blakes out there, uh, they weren't Blakes to start with, but they turned to Blakes because the content isn't what they expected or the delivery isn't connected. And again, both of those are absolutely legit. 
Um, and there are plenty of other reasons, but like hopefully this is sort of enough to broaden your sense of empathy when it comes to this sort of disengagement. Because um, if there's one thing that I sort of like cringe at, it's when people say like bo like boredom just means you're not interesting or you're not creative or whatever. It's like no, it, it is it is a legit state of mind and it deserves as much empathy as anything else. Um, and just like there could be Blake's, you know, right here uh, in this talk, there are Blake's in your system generating emails, your support articles, your policy documents, etc. Um, and so uh, the way I care for Blake's um, when I write is I try to show why my materials worth them spending their precious mental energy focusing on and digesting it, which also helps those who come here accidentally from wasting their time and energy on this material because they get to say, oh, this is actually not true. Um, and two techniques for that are just information highlighting and like bubbling actual material to the top. Um, and information highlighting is a grab bag of concepts. These are all things that many of us are doing. Um, having clear and precise titles. Uh, I used to hate TLDRs and I've like learned to embrace them over the last couple of years. Um, you know, strategically pull the passages, things like that, whatever really catches the eye and says, you know, here's why, uh, you know, here's, here's what's going on. Here's the reason to devote attention to this. Um, some disciplines call this the value proposition. And it makes this uh, obvious and relatable. Um, that gives um, like many a reason to invest mental energy, which maybe you can sit up and get some coffee or take a walk or whatever helps them sort of shake off that bored and tired feeling. Um, and our second Blake friendly technique is about cutting like sort of unnecessary content and bubbling up what's important uh, to the top. Oh, uh, you know, whatever makes up the material put in front of others takes brain energy to process. Uh, and if you've been, if you've ever had a point where you struggle to focus on something, uh, you know, you can just feel that sense of where just like your brain just starts to drip down uh, as you're like going from one paragraph to the next to the next. Um, so cut out what's unnecessary and move what's necessary to the top. Uh, there's the to me, it's, there's this classic documentation faux pas of starting with historical information that's maybe interesting, um, but definitely unnecessary. I've seen this often, and, and I used to do it when I was a, a software developer. Um, and, um, you know, again, you, you bubble that actionable material at the top. If you absolutely need to keep that unnecessary material, and I, I will always love stressing it's unnecessary when talking with like um, like uh, engineers and project managers and stuff who are really passionate about uh, the historical material because they're really passionate about the project and want to share things that are passionate to them with users. Move it to the bottom or make it a server page you link to. Whatever you do, make it so that you reduce the effort that Blake needs to expend to get to the part they need. Um, and yeah, uh, and I, I could also go on for a long time about Blake. I have a rant about how screenshots are often a detriment, but Blake needs his own out now. And again, I need to finish this talk. So now we get to talk with Cam. This is where people's attention comes back because I just put a kitten on the screen. Um, so Cam's a bit more specific uh, than the two we've seen so far. Um, after talking with Blake, you would think we'd be excited to have some camp since being curious is the opposite of checked out. But there are some detrimental sides to curiosity. And that's why there's a cam in this talk. Um, when we're curious, our minds are primed for questions. When there's a question stuck in our heads, we're hungry for the answers. And it's part of our human nature. Again, I'm making an assumption here about our humanity uh, to look for those answers. <clears throat> and it's human nature to cough in the middle of a presentation. Uh, so if you've ever had some random bit of trivia trip you up, like what's the next line of that song? Um, and you couldn't keep from, you know, pulling out your phone to look it up. You were compelled to close the loop in your head, uh, created by that question popping in. Um, it wasn't important to you know the answer to this, but it was just nagging that, and that nagging you wanted to be rid of. Um, I stumbled upon this concept um, years ago while reading uh, David Allen's positive productivity book, uh, Getting Things Done. Um, he talks about how the mind can only hold on to like 
so many unresolved loops before it's essentially at a bandwidth. Um, questions of mine operate in that same space. It's part of how clickbait headlines work. They pose the targeted question in your mind to get you click on the link to close the very loop it created. Um, and that's important because uh, while the reader interest is desirable, unregulated curiosity uh, presents hurdles for us. And those cams, they're kittens pawing at any random laser pointer. Um, and every link on your page and your email or something like that is something that a cam will paw at. And instead of focusing on the body material, um, you know, they'll see something like this. And this is something I see a lot in automated email notices. Um, like, hello, due to our blah, blah policy, which is a link to some doc, you should take some action. Let's say the actionable part now. Um, and in a reader whose curiosity is regulated or not engaged in the first place, that's not an issue. But for unregulated cams, that's an interesting link. Maybe clicking on the link and reading it briefly satisfies the curiosity, but it's as likely they find something new on that page to be curious about. Some of the laser pointer forming the side or related topic section and so on. Uh, and they're on a different journey already before you've cemented in your original communication that they need to take some action. The mental loop that you wanted to create in them was cut short. Um, so from that, we'll go ahead and let Cam go chasing something. So bye, Cam. Now we need to be careful because we've left Finley, our frustrated ferret, on hold for a while and they are not having it. Um, uh, any of you who have ever worked in support like I have can probably already empathize with a, getting a customer who's been really frustrated and has been on hold for a while and is very happy to know that to start with. Um, like being these people, they're frustrated before they get in our queue. Uh, all of that time that they've been waiting sort of adds up to that micro frustration on top. And that frustration is a communication flaw, which is not unlike anxiety. The thicker the fog, the harder it is to force support agent to break through it. So as writers, we want to diffuse the Finleys we're writing for. And, and when we can't do that, we want to at least not compound the situation with like adding micro frustration elements um, because that's just going to make that frustration fog harder for someone else's job. Um, and Finley and Avery are cousins in a sense. Uh, and just like how Avery could be anxious because of our product or from something external, uh, Finley could be frustrated again from our product or something external. Getting cut off in traffic or getting into a fight on Twitter or finding out they didn't get the promotion they fought for. Uh, then they try to log into our account, it doesn't work. What well, might have been an annoyance in the moment, <clears throat> now it was like a full blown meltdown. And and to their credit, some Finleys do try to regulate themselves, uh, recognizing that lashing out doesn't help, but they, and, and we, when we're dealing with them, are still playing at a higher difficulty level in getting them help because they're in that combative brain space. And that combative brain space means that Finleys are looking for a win. Uh, what if our docs can't help a Finley? Can we still try to give them a win before they contact support? I think we can. Uh, and this is where my first technique comes into play, which is about empathetic acknowledgement. Um, you've probably encountered this with UIs that apologize for inconveniences or support docs that acknowledge a situation and what the user's dealing with isn't fun. Um, and other places where passive text that we write tries to imprint a feeling of like, hey, your feelings are valid. Hey, we see you. Uh, this technique is also a part of support chat scripts for a reason. It's not a women form of solving Finley's problem, but even just being validated is a small win. And if that's enough to get a family to calm down, to get a family to help center themselves, that makes our job easier. And that makes any support agent who has to deal with them the job easier. And ultimately it means Finley's job of helping themselves is easier. And like I said, you might know that, like I said, I've used the, the concept of centering with a Finley and these concepts of sort of like sending you or regulating with Avery. Uh, and this goes for any agitated state of mind. And the further agitated somebody is, the thicker that communication fog that I mentioned is. Um, so that technique about de-escalating Finley, the other technique I use, which really relates to the communication fog, is to watch out for micro frustrations or micro confrontation language uh, to avoid adding to Finley's frustration. Um, 
that includes anything with a condescending flavor. Um, I, things like starting a passage with obviously, or, or I've even removed like remember that um, uh, from passages after sort of an experience over a decade ago of realizing that wasn't actually helping me. Um, and uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, and I think maybe at this point, hopefully uh, enough of you have pieced together, uh, techniques for one health persona help Finley and like cutting unnecessary material and bubbling stuff to the top for a Blake or being mindful for outbound links for Cam. And they reduce the amount of time Finley spends before getting the help they need. That's great. Um, and, you know, vice versa with these ideas about, you know, watching the language we use um, and making sure that um, we are able to affirm people will definitely help up uh, some of our other uh, personas. And if we can help a few Finleys out by showing them care, uh, uh, we're showing care, again, let's bring it back to this point, we're showing care to our support agents who would otherwise take these irate calls and be in a more difficult position. So um, thank you, Finley, for letting us borrow you, and I hope you find some chill soon. <sighs> that leaves us with Pat, our crowd peak doc. Um, Pat's another specialized persona like Cam, one particularly prevalent in high expertise fields um, like software development, but really can pop up anywhere. Uh, and pride like curiosity uh, is fine on its own, but pride unregulated can turn into arrogance or smugness or entitlement and a desire to recapture a feeling of superiority they feel like they've lost for some reason. So what does this look like? Um, well, on the casual end, it can look as simple as someone commenting on your grammar, which helpful people also do. But whereas the helpful person comments and moves on, in the back of Pat's mind, there's a desire to keep looking, to focus on flaws and on the material substance, um, or rather what those Pats perceive as flaws. Um, and the thing about the two specialized personas in this talk is that they're not often aware that they're in a state that's not optimal for them. Avery, Blake, and Finley might be aware they're on edge or checked out or irate, but Kat, Pat or Cam aren't necessarily as mindful uh, because those states are harder to be self-aware of without training. And that lack of awareness makes addressing communication issues harder. So um, how do we deal with that? Um, now, how do we deal with users that are in this confrontational headspace who aren't necessarily aware of it? We're writing passively to many users, you know, hundreds, thousands, you know, perhaps millions. Uh, so we can't just hit each one of them up on chat. Are you okay? Or like, hey, you're kind of being a jerk right now. You've gone a little bit far. Um, the best we can do is to try to make our material like pat resistant. Um, and the first, um, you know, the first section I have is to sort of keep and maintain a taxonomy or a glossary or lexicon. Um, if you can ensure that your terminology is clear and consistent throughout all of your product and your support documentation and everything else, uh, you can reduce some of the pat pain points. Again, this also helps everyone else, um, and which includes you, when the inevitable rebrand or redesign comes along. Um, you, and if you want to build one, you don't even really need to start with like a full-fledged, you know, like the word taxonomy can be like intimidating to some people. Uh, you really can just start with like a simple glossary. Like, you know, what, what can you do to ensure that your basic terminology is clear and consistent, right? Like, ask these particular questions. Um, you know, what terms do you use and how often? Nouns, verbs, adjectives, or sort of identify the flexible so you know you're using in the right part of the speech and you're not uh, getting colloquial um, in, in some of the usage. Um, what terms have subtle differences from the common language meaning versus what terms are pretty much the common language meaning or what terms are really super not? Um, do they have synonyms that you want to use? Do they have synonyms you don't want to use? Um, what sort of colloquialisms are you comfortable with or do you expect support agents to use but you may not necessarily want to use in your documentation sort of for official purposes? Um, and when you know these key terms, you also know word soy casually. Uh, for instance, a key term uh, in your system is the word aspect. Uh, you shouldn't use that word casually, such as an aspect of Pat is literalism. 
the other suggestion I have is to get your examples reviewed by experts who understand your users. It could be code example on a dev site, which many of us are dev docs people. We have done this a lot. This is not new. But it could also be a business example for an ad tech help center. It could be anything like that. Like it doesn't just have to be think about you know looking at your code, but think about looking at all of your specific elements. Uh, get them reviewed for relevance as well as accuracy. Pats can get hung up on the details, particularly with examples. Um, so to get ahead of them, to get these robust reviews, especially if an example is long and critical to understanding the doc. So that's enough about Pat. And in not a lot of time, I've walked you through five significant categories of emotional states. And I didn't include one like Ray the receptive rabbit because as long as we're considering our other users, we'll handle our calm, respective ones with, with no problem. Uh, and for those of you who are familiar with accessibility and inclusive design, you might realize the semi-secretly and accessible communication talk. It follows like a similar philosophy to accessibility, which is where when you make your work accessible to more people, it benefits everyone, not just those people. Um, one thing that uh, happens when I give this talk, and I've given this talk a bunch, is that people map themselves to just with one proponent, one persona. They're like, oh, I'm totally an Avery, or yeah, I'll admit I'm a Pat. Uh, and that's too narrow a way to think about it. This is not a tag yourself meme. Like, take me, I, I'm a pretty anxious person, but I also get bored. Um, I have plenty of times when I'm curious without focus. I definitely get frustrated, and I'm not proud to admit that I have my proud side as well. Um, and we're all of these at different times. We're also all receptive at different times, being that sort of Ray the receptive rabbit. We're also those as well. And we're certainly other states that I haven't covered. You might feel like you genuinely lean one or two ways, but all of these are inside. So there's a couple calls to action. Like, you know, this is all fine and good. It's all like writing philosophy. What do you do with it, right? Well, first, you can take something you've written recently. You can mark it up with how you think each of these five personas would take it. And maybe get two or three of you together to talk about what you found. Uh, and second, uh, when you catch yourself in one of these states, examine that state. Uh, if it's combative or high heart rate state, center yourself. Note down if the material caused that state or if you were already there when that happened. Um, were you there because of something related to the material, um, something separate or a combination? Um, what you learn from that self-examining can raise your emotional proficiency, which raises your ability to tackle these sorts of problems. Uh, and just to end again, that these emotions are valid no matter where they come from. That's really, really clear. Like there's no shame in what our users are feeling. We don't, I don't want to, you know, ever in sort of this talk or anything related suggest that that's something that we should think about. Um, so again, this is me. Uh, I'm, I'm Ryan Macklin. Uh, I just got back on Twitter. Uh, and again, my cat has an Instagram. Uh, and I also am the co-organizer of Write the Docs Support Windsor, uh, which like everything else is online right now. So, you know, check it out on Meetup. Um, and here's like a little quick reference that I have here, which since it's getting recorded out uh, into the world. Um, is there is sort of some questions that I consider. Um, feel free to also, like, you know, screen cap this if you like. I will go ahead and uh, leave it up for a moment. That is my talk on emotional personas. Thank you, Ryan. Are you, uh, are you happy to take some questions? Either folks can post them in the chat and I'll monitor that or people are more than, uh, for those who are happy to do audio and video, please feel free to jump on that way. Yeah, totally. Uh, and did you want to record the questions as well? Yeah, I can record the questions. We'll see if, like, maybe I'll cut them or not, depending on the size of the video. But yeah, let's go ahead and record them. Great. It looks like we do have one from the chat, and it says, uh, where do you draw the line between harsh language choices versus straightforward imperative statements? So it depends on, for me, it would depend on the subject. Um, the more serious um, the subject, like especially if it's something where there's a destructive element to it, like you could, you know, delete all your data from this. Um, I would go with very 
very pointed statements. There's actually a a bit like again, this is like a like some of the like advanced Avery talk that I've given has actually been about when to actually create anxiety in people and the right kind of anxiety. And some of that is to make them aware of like make them very much feel a sense of trepidation to to say something destructive that they're going to do, whether it's financially or logistically or whatever. Um, the um, but like it's still like you can still do that and still keep with ton intentionality at the same time. Um, there are straightforward sentences that you can say that don't necessarily have to involve um, like unnecessary cautioning um, or uh, any sort of like micro confrontational language. I don't think they're necessarily two different things. Um, softening language is great, but uh, like tone intentionality can also work for hard language for like really pointed language. If I could add to that, Ryan, I'm guessing that one of the phenomena you you might have encountered is that if we have an idea that users tend to make a certain kind of mistake, even if it's not a serious one, or even if it just ends up going slightly off track and then you can come quickly back on, um, mm -hmm. one of the documentation solutions is to warn people not to do that. Mm -hmm. um, but is that, but in a lot of cases, if they do that, it really doesn't matter and it's fine. So that would be a case where it might be really easy to create unnecessary warnings. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like, like the, the, the bit there is, and, and this is very much a, um, I see this from a lot of times I'll see this from like people who write, who are support, uh, agents first, writer second. Um, because this is the experience that they've had to deal with. Um, and they're translating that individual user experience into a doc for a broad audience. Um, the, um, which again, I was a support agent a long time ago. This is one of the things that I had to learn. Um, the, um, uh, but yeah, so like getting to that state of uh, how do you write it and not have it be a warning? Or how do you write it and have it be a soft warning? Um, and that like is I like I'd say like I mean that ends up being like why writing is also partly an art. I think also at this point I can stop <clears throat> the the screen here so I can actually see everyone. All right. Um so yeah, that is um I don't know if that answered the question or not. Uh yeah, I'm the one who asked it. It it it, it does. It's something I, I come up against, you know quite a bit most mostly I ask because I write you know API documentation where you're always giving enough rope to hang yourself with yeah it's it's you're you know when you do these things you're messing with real data that's potentially not yours and unrecoverable yeah so uh, we have uh, chocolate and it looks as though they asked how often do you check the personas? How do you plan content changes for newly added and removed personas? Um, well, I don't like these personas have been pretty static for me for a number of years. Um, it's really about, um, it's a mental framework for um, making sure that the, the end product that, we're, that I'm sending out to users uh, has a sense of users in mind. Um, instead of just a, like, I'm not, I'm not trying to achieve an objective for my product team. I'm trying to achieve objective for my users. That also happens to be the objective my product team wants. Um, or even, as actually something that I, I do is I even try to say people instead of users, because that's a very, it's a subtle difference, but it's a really important one. So I'm people first, product second. Um, even though the product is what's paying me, although the people are paying the, never mind that you can follow that logic. Um, so, but I would say, um, a lot of it is in a sense of, um, uh, is, is in a sense of like patterns. Like I, like, it's like this, this, you know, this sort of style of email, like I, I write some, uh, like philosophy and structure docs, uh, as part of my day job. And some of it is like, here's when we should use a TLDR because this is the sort of, email that's about to tell you you're about to lose access. My, my, um, uh, at the, right now, my main uh, writing for Tech and UI is about um, access management systems. So I write a bunch of automated emails, like you're about to lose access, or 
someone needs access or things like that. Um, so a lot of it is like, you know, that like, you know, like how do I make sure that a board Blake uh, actually will read this email and address it? So that's where I'm like, okay, here are the things that I do to combat that. Uh, for things about losing access, how do I make sure that somebody who's anxious doesn't panic and freeze up? Um, so it really is about a series of questions to ask in a lot of these situations and about patterns to follow. Um, the, uh, uh, I'm talking with some people right now, and this is going to be like a long time from now, but I'm talking about like internally maybe having some uh, language checkers and like sort of like natural language processing to catch some of these, but we've just barely started those conversations. Uh, I'm excited for that. Um, right now, it's really just been very much in the art form approach of, you know, how am I making sure that I'm doing this in a very human way? Um, but yeah, uh, and, and when I've done this long enough that it is just sort of baked into my process in general, um, but it is, and, but it is, uh, um, so it's really just how I write, how I think about the patterns that are in my head or documented somewhere that I bring to my writing. I don't know if that, does that answer your question? Yes, it is. I think it sounds like uh, these personas are like guidelines, writing yeah. guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're like, yeah. It's, it's a combination. It's like, a, it's a philosophy that is, it's, it's about how to think about writing guidelines. Mm -hmm. Um, the effect that these writing guidelines can have on people. Uh, have you promoted this uh, actually to your fellow writers? Uh, yeah, yeah, I have. Like this is uh, um, within uh, like within Google and then the company I was at before. Uh, this was sort of my, I was like basically brainstorming and working on this for a while. Um, but yeah, this was, um, uh, and then everyone basically said I should actually give this talk. This is the third time in like a month I've given this talk. So I'm trying to get the idea out there. Um, I have a lot of people who are interested in, sort of, uh, in this as a framework uh, to teach people sort of how to think about writing. And I'm looking at also how to turn this into material so that people who want to learn how to do writing, technical writing, can use it as a sense of philosophy. But that is like, a lot of these things are down the road. I was, uh, um, but this is a way to teach philosophy of writing rather than teaching just the mechanics of it. Please let me know when you actually roll out the material. I, I would definitely sign up. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, I that's probably what I'll actually use my Twitter for. Or, or that, so feel free to follow that. I like almost never use it. I left Twitter years ago, and that, my mental health was great after that. So I'm dipping back in because I'm a glutton for punishment, much like Rose is, but in a different way. That's why we're friends. And get yeah. Along. And I love how I just referenced something that's not actually going to be in the recording. Kind of, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'll definitely let you know. I will not be quiet about it when I create something like that for sure. Thank you. Right, it looks like you had a question. Yeah, I just wondered if you had examples of the before and the after. I, I thought of it right away when you had the, the worried ferret and the frustrated, um, well, the armadillo, I think, was the worried one. Yeah. I, you know, I always come across phrases that say, do not do this. And I'm like, what? Don't tell me that. Now I want to do it. <laughs> um. So it'd be nice if you had some like before and then after tuning the um uh i don't like at this point i don't like i like i haven't edited anybody else's writing that deeply in a long <laughs> time um uh to have that example so really it's just me knowing like a lot of these rules are just baked into into what i'm doing um the other before the only i think the before and after i probably have might be internal stuff where when I have gone through and done some rewriting of it because it needed to be updated anyway, um, the like the CSAT of it uh, increased, but that's all internal stuff I couldn't share anyway. Um, but yeah, that's um, uh, yeah, that's I I would love to be able to put something together. Like there's a lot of places here where I wish I could put examples in, but 
Like it already is, it already is on the edge of a long talk. So, and that's right. what I want to follow up with is actually get deeper into each of these concepts. And Ryan, one of the things you'd mentioned early on is that you were thinking of considering a word other than persona. And I can understand that because I've seen that word being overloaded and diverging in meaning in ways that has been made it difficult to communicate at my company for sure. Yeah. <laughs> a couple of words that had occurred to me um, was one being archetype, because it seems like you're coming up with essentially kind of arch emotional archetypes of emotional states and of the users move through. Mm -hmm. um, and the literary side of my brain was wondering if allegory might even be uh -huh. mm. an interesting one because I bet a lot of the we, allegory would be a term that has not been used much in technology yet. <laughs> yeah, like I, I originally called it persona because I wanted to draw people in for mm -hmm. that reason of like, what, what do you mean? But I think at this point, I don't need that anymore. Um, mm -hmm. But I just haven't had another thing to call it yet. Um, I've had some suggestions, like somebody suggested roles. Uh, somebody suggested profiles too, um, but profiles I think has a similar thing of like kind of being overloaded, but it's still yeah. like generic enough that it could kind of work. But yeah, no, I'll have to, I, I like those, I'll have, to, I'll have to chew on those. I'm going to spend a while on thesaurus.com one of these days and just, I, which is uh, my, my, one of my little joys is naming things. I will spend weeks figuring out the name for something and that I'm <laughs> working on personally. Um, and so it'll just be a lot of thesaurus.com and other searches and uh, learning about words I didn't know about. Like if uh, I, a few months ago, learned about the word ambit, which I'm not going to define for you. I'm going to say, go search for A-M-B-I-T, ambit, you know, and, and maybe you can use it in your own stuff. Um, Does that need a uh, not safe for work tag? It is a legit, totally cool, safe for life cool. uh, and work. Great. Thought I would double check. I didn't yeah, see I, it. I respect so it that. It would no. be. You can, you can but, you yeah, know, but it's most a Merriam of us Webster. are no work machines, so. Yeah. It's a Merriam-Webster search, not a Urban Dictionary search. Nice. Just noted, you said ambit, and I saw everyone's heads kind of swing that yeah. way. Yeah. <laughs> I, I was guilty, too. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, it's my favorite new word. I had to, uh, since I'm still a game writer, and I had to come up with something for a, a game term, and trolling through the short through a thesaurus. Yeah, that's what I came up with. It's a good um, word. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, any other questions? I'm also happy to like turn it over to the second times. Which it sounds like from the silence, I'm totally going to turn it to the social happy times. So I'm going to stop this recording. Uh, and thank you all. Um, well, I mean, I'm going to stay, but this is waiting for the <laughs>